Okay, doctors, we're going to move on with our next lecture, which is vascular surgery, venous and carotid artery diseases, vascular trauma, trauma and hemodialysis access. Again, here's Dr. Desai. All right. We should get uh, moving because we have a lot to cover in this next section. Um, so this is basically all the other diseases in vascular that we'll be covering in the next hour and a half. Again, no disclosures relevant to this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about venous disease, carotid artery disease, vascular trauma, and then access. Uh, so the venous disease we'll start with. Uh, so through this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of venous insufficiency, which is probably one of the most common problems we encounter. Uh, diagnosis and treatment of deep vein thrombosis. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about anticoagulation and some of the complications. I think you guys have a separate coagu coagulation parameter talk, so I'll try not to spend too much time on the coagulation system itself. Um, talk about IVC filters and varicose veins. Question, a 58-year-old man is being evaluated for a non-healing ulcer on the medial aspect of his right calf. He has a history of a right tibial fracture and right lower extremity DVT 15 years ago. His exam shows moderate right lower extremity edema with a five centimeter diameter superficial ulcer and surrounding hyperpigmentation. What is the most appropriate initial management for this patient? Anticoagulation with warfarin, application of a paste gauze Una's boot, Split thickness skin grafting for the ulcer, venogram and possible balloon angioplasty and stent placement, venous perforator ligation surgery. The correct answer is application of paste gauze Una's boot. Uh, so uh, venous insufficiency is re essentially a reflux at the venous uh, valves. Uh, this can occur from intrinsic weakness in the wall. Uh, it can be primary uh, with this weakness uh, occurring um, from an unknown etiology, or it can be secondary after uh, a thrombotic event, deep vein thrombosis, uh, also known as post-phlebitic syndrome, uh, or it can be secondary related to trauma to veins. And then there are congenital forms of venous insufficiency uh, that have also been uh, defined. The symptoms of venous insufficiency include swelling or edema, hyperpigmentation of the skin, uh, sclerosis of the subcutaneous tissues, uh, as well as ulceration, which tends to occur on the medial aspect of the leg between the knee and the ankle. Venous disease is classified using the SEEP classification, which you may be asked about. This classification includes the clinical picture, uh, etiology, uh, anatomic distribution, and pathophysiology. Um, we'll review the clinical picture in more detail on the next slide. Uh, the etiology can range from congenital, primary, secondary. Uh, the specific veins affected are defined with uh, the anatomic classification. And then the pathophysiology, can, which can be reflux or venous insufficiency, um, obstruction, or both of these processes occurring. This is a um, description of the clinical classification. The C class of the SEEP classification can range from no symptoms and signs to uh, active ulcerations and skin changes and a variety of changes in between. In addition to this classification, there are a variety of quality of life questionnaires that are also available for patients with venous disease. And there's uh, an additional different venous severity scoring system, uh, which also correlates with the SEEP classification and gives you a different objective measure. The SEEP classification is probably most widely used in terms of describing venous disease. So uh, in terms of diagnosing uh, venous disease, duplex ultrasound is probably most commonly used. It can help define anatomy uh, in terms of the location of the issue as well as detect reflux. 
uh, in patients, particularly with positional maneuvers to look for uh, reflux. Uh, other testing that can be used, plethysmography is a mechanism to look, to estimate volumes uh, within limbs and with different uh, positional factors uh, looking at uh, uh, changes in this volume to help define whether there are issues with uh, venous function. Uh, venography essentially is an invasive procedure that has no role for initial intervention of venous disease. We uh, use it typically in situations where we're planning some sort of intervention, but otherwise it's not really used. And then there's a technique of uh, measuring ambulatory venous pressure, which again is an invasive procedure uh, to measure pressure and um, it may correlate with ulcer risk, but it's not a diagnostic test that's typically used in the classic venous patient. Um, patients who have venous insufficiency, um, compression is uh, probably the mainstay of treatment of uh, these patients. Uh, this can range from compression stockings, which we use for milder disease, to different types of uh, uh, compression boots, such as an una boot. Um, although a very varying different types of compression dressings are now available for patients who have ulcers associated with venous insufficiency. In more severe phases of uh, leg swelling, um, in addition to compression stockings or compression devices, a variety of intermittent pneumatic compression devices may also be available. And then uh, just in considering patients who have very refractory ulcers uh, that are resistant to some of the compression boot and wound uh, care that we give them, uh, skin grafting or some sort of uh, skin allergenic um, bilayer may be appropriate for these patients as well. How do we fix the cause of the venous insufficiency, the uh, uh, venous reflux that occurs? Um, we can, we basically don't have good procedures to fix vein valves. Various things have been tried with uh, essentially poor success rates. Um, in patients that have severe venous obstruction uh, related to prior DVTs or some sort of anatomic obstruction, we can consider trying to re-canalize those obstructions or do some sort of bypass around the venous system. In general, bypasses for veins don't work uh, very well because of the lower pressure system that we're uh, working in. and. Um, Often we'll need to do an AV fistula to try to improve the flows across those vein bypasses to keep them open. But these are pretty rarely performed procedures and probably not the mainstay of treatments for venous insufficiency. Uh, May Thurner syndrome is a diagnosis that sometimes you're asked about with respect to the venous system. It is a compression of the left common iliac artery by the uh, excuse me, the left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery where it crosses it near its origin. Uh, it can uh, predispose patients to iliac vein thrombosis. Uh, and, and in a patient that presents with left iliac vein thrombosis, it's a consideration of a diagnosis. Um, the ultimate treatment, if you're able to get the left iliac vein uh, open with thrombolytic treatment, um, or even with anticoagulation alone, is uh, to try to stent open that area of compression. Um, in uh, previous eras, uh, we used to do some kind of venous bypass around the area to try to open up that vein. Um, typically, that's not required these days. A self-expanding stent um, is the treatment of choice for these patients. So we'll talk a little bit about deep vein thrombosis. This is a very common disease process in surgical patients. Um, important to think about the risk factors for DVT. Uh, it's more, much more common in hospitalized patients than patients that are at home. Hypertensive patients have higher risk of DVT, recent surgery, immobility for any reason, uh, cancer, uh, uh, and obesity all predispose you to deep vein thrombosis. Um, the 
concept of Virchow's triads, important stasis, endothelial damage, and the hypercoagulable state. So any of the pathophysiologic conditions that predispose you to this, uh, you want to think about uh, patients having a DVT or developing a DVT in that setting. Uh, more than 50% of patients with DVTs may be asymptomatic. Uh, swelling of the calf or ankle is probably the most common finding. Um, some negative predictors on, uh, in terms of physical exam and presentation, uh, if the calf circumference is equal in both legs, uh, if the difference is less than two centimeters, DVT is less likely. Um, patients that are outpatients without any provoking risk factors or oncologic history are probably lower risk for DVT. Uh, the location of discomfort that the patient may present with um, might lead you towards or against DVT if the discomfort is in joint spaces um, uh, or if the patient has a cellulitis that's associated with their discomfort, this is probably less likely to be a DVT. Duplex ultrasound is the uh, diagnostic test of choice, um, and the way that we diagnose DVTs in the lower extremity is with incompressibility. So we identify the vein. Uh, we can look with duplex at the flow through the vein, but we uh, specifically look at whether that vein is compressible or not. Typically, acutely um, acute thrombus within veins uh, results in enlargement of the vein as well. This can be a, a clue. Uh, the duplex is pretty uh, is very sensitive. Um, for acute DVT as well. Some of the limitations is that you, it's harder to look for compressibility in more proximal veins, so we have to look at a more indirect exam, uh, such as looking at uh, loss of respiratory variation uh, of venous flow in those uh, segments. Um, it can be tougher to look at tibial veins with duplex as well. Um, in some patients in whom uh, duplex may not be available uh, because of your hospital system or because of their location, D-dimer can uh, be useful in uh, helping to detect venous thromboembolism. It's useful if it's negative in a clinically low-risk patient. Um, uh, positive res results, especially in a hospitalized patient with uh, other reasons to have an elevated D-dimer, it may not be quite as useful in those patients. So it may be useful in an uh, outpatient setting uh, in someone who you have a relatively low clinical risk in. Question, um, to function as an anticoagulant, what cofactor does low molecular weight heparin require? A, fibrinogen, B, plasminogen, C, thrombomodulin, D, factor II, and E, or E, antithrombin. The answer is E, antithrombin. Antithrombin three is a cofactor for low molecular weight heparin. So we'll talk a little bit about the therapies available for uh, DVT treatment. And uh, in terms of some of these factors and cofactors and when you get to your coagulation parameters, there's really no easy answers in terms of the board exam other than just memorizing them <laughs> before you get to the test part. So I, you know, the, I think we all, we all do this. Um, so the general goals of treatment of deep vein thrombosis are number one, to prevent pulmonary embolism, which is the life-threatening complication of DVT, um, to prevent proximal uh, or any extension of the deep vein thrombosis. Uh, the goal is to get the patient to a therapeutic level of anticoagulation within 24 hours. Uh, and then um, in terms of continuing the treatment and time periods that we continue the treatment. We'll talk about this a little bit, but we want to uh, basically prevent recurrence of uh, these DVTs, both in an early uh, time period as well as later on down the road. So we have a number of options. Um, in the acute setting, we have low molecular weight heparin option. Uh, we have unfractionated heparin options. Um, which can be delivered in a variety of ways. And then uh, in the current era, there are a number of oral anticoagulants in addition to fundaparinox that uh, can achieve therapeutic levels relatively quickly. Uh, and these can often be useful in an outpatient setting. Um, there are different types of newer oral anticoagulants. It's important to think about the types of uh, factors that they inhibit in terms of how they work. Um, 
a number of them have been shown to be as efficacious as the traditional uh, heparin or low molecular weight heparin followed by Coumadin combination. Um, they have a shorter half-life and a much uh, more rapid onset overall, so there's a reduced need for bridging. The biggest issue with the oral anticoagulants is that most of them, except uh, dabigatran, which recently had an inhibitor um, released, most of them lack an inhibitor, so you can't reverse it. Um, they have much more consistent activity, so you don't need to monitor them as frequently. So again, in uh, active uh, outpatients, they're often um, a useful treatment to consider. Uh, unfractionated heparin is probably the oldest tried and true uh, initial treatment for DVT. Um, so just this, this chart just sort of summarizes some of the mechanisms uh, of how unfraction, unfractionated heparin works. Um, uh, the half-life varies with the dose. Um, you typically give a bolus followed by a drip. Um, and the mechanism, the main mechanism is that it inhibits thrombin and factor 10A. Uh, these types of questions do come up on the board exams. And as I said before, with all of these agents, you just have to look at these charts and memorize them before the test in terms of how they work. Um, the side effects of heparin, other than the common side effects of any anticoagulant, um, such as bleeding, uh, are the, is the issue of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, um, tends to occur after some amount of exposure to unfractionated heparin. It's for some reason more common in women, um, and, uh, it, uh, uh, reduces the platelet count. We'll talk a little bit about the mechanism of this in a slide coming up. Uh, for patients that are maintained on long-term heparin, uh, there is a risk of osteoporosis. This is usually for more prolonged heparin administration. So uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia um, is probably one of the more common things that comes up in a hospitalized patient. It's related to an antibody to platelet factor four that develops. Uh, this activates platelets, uh, generates platelet microparticles, um, and uh, results in excessive thrombin production. It's sort of a similar pathophysiologic mechanism to DIC. Uh, there are different diagnostic tests. There's a functional test as well as um, uh, an enzyme link test. Um, clinical uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia with a drop in platelet counts and the clinical syndrome uh, that's similar to DIC occurs actually in a minority of patients that may be antibi antibody positive. So there's not a direct correlation, uh, which is why the functional assay may be more useful. Um, the treatment. Uh, is to avoid heparin for at least three months after the uh, diagnosis or incident. Um, uh, you want to reverse Coumadin. You want uh, eventually want to get use. First, you want to use a direct thrombin inhibitor to anticoagulate the patient, and then eventually the patient should be anticoagulated for a period of time. This is just a diagram of. Um, uh, the uh, way that heparin binds platelet factor IV um, uh, and uh, makes large immune complexes that then can bind the platelet receptors, uh, resulting in uh, activation of the platelets and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, low molecular weight heparin has come on the scene in the last um, 10, 15 years. It's uh, more available, has a longer half-life. Um, it's more of a factor 10A inhibitor than uh, thrombin. Um, doesn't require monitoring in the same way. It has a lower risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, and it may be more effective in preventing proximal DVTs in higher risk patients. So it's uh, often used uh, uh, in hospitalized patients these days. Um, the bleeding risk for this, again, depends on the dose. It's renally cleared, so it's important to uh, keep that in mind uh, for patients with renal insufficiency. Uh, Fondaparinox, Rixtra is another one of the newer anticoagulants. It's a synthetic uh, analog of uh, binding sequence. Um, it binds only to antithrombin um, and inhibits only factor 10A. Um, has a longer half-life. There's no antidote available for this. Um, numerous other uh, oral anticoagulants are available, all of which have slightly different mechanisms, uh, so it's important to just think about the different mechanisms um, 
uh, depending on which of those is uh, used. Um, and then the most uh, tried and true and the one that you'll probably be asked about more than the newer anticoagulants is uh, the use of warfarin. Um, so um, uh, it inhibits factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, the interesting thing about warfarin is that it inhibits protein C and S first. So patients need to be anticoagulated with heparin or Lovenox prior to initiating heparin um, as a rule of thumb. We don't do this in every single patient, and we often won't do it in a patient that has seen heparin and Lovenox, been on Coumadin, and then we're re resuming their Coumadin. But for the purposes of the boards, these patients should get heparin or Lovenox first before you start Coumadin. Uh, and the reason you want to do that is that you um, don't want to inhibit protein CNS first. This can lead to warfarin skin necrosis if the patient's not anticoagulated. Um, you monitor Coumadin with the INR levels, and the typical therapeutic INR levels vary depending on what you are treating. But for the purposes of DVT, um, you want their INR to be two to two and a half um, for patients that are getting Coumadin for other reasons like valvular disease or artificial valves. The INR levels may be, um, you may keep them in a higher range. Other important thing about Coumadin or Warfarin is that it is contraindicated in pregnancy. There are a variety of uh, central nervous system defects, uh, stillbirth, abortion, hemorrhage, ocular defects, lots of uh, defects that can occur with pregnancy. So it is uh, not to be used in the pregnant woman. With a DVT, how long do we continue anticoagulation? So if you develop a DVT, uh, Due to a reversible risk, depending on the location of the DVT, we continue anticoagulation for three to six months. Three months for more distal DVTs, six months for more sort of DVTs from the knee level and above. For an unprovoked DVT, you might want to consider uh, continuing anticoagulation for longer. Um, we don't know, you know, if you don't define the risk in that patient of why they developed the TVT, DVT, their risk is going to revert to whatever risk they had to begin with uh, when you stop the therapy. In cancer patients, another group of patients that come in frequently with deep vein thromboses, you want to um, think about using low molecular weight heparin early in the course of their DVT. These patients uh, clotting problems are often refractory to Coumadin. There have been some studies that came out showing that Coumadin is not as effective. Um, and then you can think about trying Coumadin in these patients versus continuing low molecular weight heparin indefinitely, or at least until their cancer is resolved. Um, again, as we talked about, the target INR for the, anti the anticoagulation with warfarin is uh, two to two and a half range. There's a subgroup of people that sometimes will present with just tibial vein, deep vein thromboses, uh, and options for these patients uh, can vary a little bit. These DVTs are generally thought to be uh, at somewhat lower risk of embolizing uh, and causing pulmonary embolus. So the general risk of a PE in a patient with a more proximal DVT is in the 30, 35% range without treatment. For tibial vein DVTs, that risk is probably 10% or less. Um, so you can think about either not anticoagulating them, in which case you should um, do some sort of surveillance duplex in a week or two to check for propagation. The reason or rationale for that may be that a uh, significant uh, proportion will not show any progression. And after the two-week period, they're probably not likely to progress any further, so you don't necessarily need further ongoing imaging and surveillance. Uh, or you can anticoagulate them for a shorter period of time um, in order to prevent extension. Uh, in general, my rule of thumb is that if the patient has significant swelling or symptoms I'll in, and is a reasonable risk for, uh, for being able to be anticoagulated, I will anticoagulate them. If they are higher risk or if they do not have significant symptoms, I'll consider um, doing a surveillance study in a week or two to check for propagation. Uh, some of the risk factors for patients that might progress that you want to consider anticoagulating if it's close or if it's an extensive DVT, if there's no uh, provoking factor, if they have cancer, they've had previous DVTs in the past, these are patients that you might want to uh, err on the side of starting on anticoagulation. Um, this is just a chart looking at different types of um, 
anticoagulants, what their mechanisms are, what needs to be monitored, some of the pluses and minuses. It's a good reference for uh, before you take the exam. Um, so we'll start, go with another question. A 45-year-old man develops an acutely painful cyanotic and tense left calf two days after being hospitalized for a femur fracture. A duplex ultrasound demonstrates a left iliofemoral DVT. What is the most likely diagnosis? A, arterial embolism. B, great saphenous thrombophlebitis. C, phlegmasia cerulea dolens. D, venous gangrene. E, cellulitis. The correct answer is C, phlegmasia cerulea dolens. So in addition to this sort of life-threatening complication of PE, DVTs in specific circumstances can uh, progress to uh, severe uh, venous congestion. Phlegmasia cerulea dolens occurs uh, due typically to occlusive thrombosis of extensive venous systems. It's a multi-level DVT, um, typically affects iliac, femoral, saphenous systems. Um, the clinical scenario is typically that of a patient that has another critical illness. There's some component of dehydration. There's uh, potentially a component of uh, a hypercoagulable state. Um, and the clinical signs that you see are that the limb is massively edematous, and it can progress eventually to uh, cyanosis, modeling, and ultimately gangrene. There's a component of compartment syndrome that is also um, probably associated with this diagnosis. Um, often there can be acute fluid loss related to it, um, and these patients are often in shock. So here are some photographs of early versus uh, late phlegmasia. Uh, the image on the right is really uh, uh, almost a venous uh, gangrene type of picture developing. The situation I've seen this most commonly in is in um, cancer patients. It can be reported in trauma patients with a lot of hemodynamic instability as well. Uh, so uh, this is sort of um, treatment algorithm in terms of how you approach these patients. Uh, trying to get control of the um, Severe swelling and increased pressure in the limb is critical. Um, so you start with anticoagulation. Uh, think about uh, lytic therapy for these patients if they are reasonable candidates. Uh, now, in the current era, we have a number of mechanical thrombolytic uh, strategies that we can address iliac vein thrombosis with as well. Um, and then if it persists, those are the patients in whom to consider venous thrombectomy, which I think is a very rare procedure in the current day, but the board exams will still ask about it. So um, these, this slide is really to talk a little bit about venous thrombectomy from a board perspective, who should get it, and then how you do it. Um, so the indication in, is really an occlusive iliofemoral DVT in a patient with phlegmasia. So those are the people that you would consider venous thrombectomy in. Um, the technique um, is sometimes asked about, uh, and uh, it's very rarely done nowadays. You can do it through an inguinal incision. Um, you want to do an iliocaval thrombectomy under positive pressure because you want to prevent pulmonary embolus while you're doing this type of thrombectomy. The distal clot in the leg is typically removed mechanically uh, with massage, with an ESMARC. Um, and then you want to do a completion venogram uh, as well. That's an important component of this to look for residual clot. Uh, back bleeding often isn't a good indicator because you can get back bleeding from an internal iliac vein, even when a common iliac vein is still occluded by thrombus. Um, and then uh, an AV fistula is uh, typically done to increase flow across an area where you've done a thrombectomy. Um, again, as I mentioned um, before, the operative venous thrombectomy is, um, has been largely replaced by uh, some of the mechanical 
thrombectomy devices that are available and that can be used percutaneously. The final thing to mention with respect to the venous thrombectomy is that you want to think about doing a fasciotomy in these patients as well. Um, and often we'll start with a fasciotomy because there is a component of compartment syndrome that can occur in these patients and contribute to their um, phlegmasia and uh, 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 venous gangrene. So we're going to change gears a little bit, talk about superficial venous thrombosis. Um, this is thrombus within a superficial vein. It is typically not a significant risk for pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis unless it exists close to the deep system. Uh, it's typically treated with anti-inflammatories and symptomatic treatment. Uh, op any kind of operative treatment is reserved for uh, failure of uh, of conservative therapy, and this can take uh, weeks uh, to resolve on its own. If there's systemic signs of severe infection, more extensive induration and redness, if there's positive cultures in a patient that's immunocompromised, these are people in whom you might want to consider uh, excising vein um, uh, if the patients are toxic, if they don't improve with antibiotics. Um, and then uh, the additional uh, treatment you want to think about is in patients that have uh, superficial vein thrombosis close to the junction, so saphenofemoral junction for the great saphenous, saphenopopliteal junction for the small saphenous. Uh, you can think about putting those patients on anticoagulants, uh, usually with, if it's within two centimeters of the junction, we'll anticoagulate them, and usually just for three months. Um, there is uh, uh, you may want to reevaluate some of these patients that have had superficial thrombophlebitis. If their vein recanalizes and they have significant venous insufficiency, you can think about uh, doing a vein uh, ablation treatment. They talk about ligation and stripping for the purposes of the boards. Nowadays, most of us will do ablations um, for those patients if they have continued venous insufficiency to try to prevent future episodes. Um, we talked about venous thrombectomy. This is just a diagram of some of the different types of uh, devices that are available for uh, percutaneous thrombolysis for DVTs. Um, these tend to come and go on the market <laughs> based on the companies and recalls. Uh, the one that I'm currently using the most is just AngioJet uh, with different types of newer, bigger catheters that have become available for it to try to get the clot out. Um, Results from thrombolysis, um, the one key advantage to using thrombolytic treatment is preserving valvular function, which is significantly better um, after uh, thrombolysis. Um, uh, and this potentially can prevent the issue related to post-phlebitic syndrome and valve dysfunction in these patients, uh, the chronic swelling that can occur after a DVT. And the final issue with DVT, inferior vena cava filter placement, um, there, were a, there was a lot of liberalization of IVC filter use uh, after uh, uh, the initial percutaneous filters were introduced and then retrievable filters were introduced. Uh, in general, the only absolute indication for IVC filters is acute proximal DVT and a contraindication to anticoagulation. Other relative indications to think about filter use are patients who have recurrent pulmonary emboli despite anticoagulation, uh, patients with a previous severe pulmonary embolus in whom a second PE could be catastrophic. Um, I think prophylactic indications are uh, basically um, not performed anymore. Uh, and most vascular surgeons will not recommend prophylactic indications, mostly because we started doing these prophylactic filters with retrievable filters, but most of them were left in place, and they have significantly higher complication rates. There's a bunch of data coming out with respect to that when they're left in place. Um, the bottom line with filters is that they're effective in the short run, meaning within the first couple of years for pre protecting from PE, but there is an increased risk of DVT in the long term. And when these DVT occurs, they can often involve thrombosis of the entire cava, which can be catastrophic and very difficult to manage. And the protection from PE in the long run is probably uh, not maintained, and the pathophysiology isn't completely understood, may relate to collateral development, et cetera. And then the final issue with these filters is that we're putting these retrievable filters in, and if you're going to put one of those in, you really should make every attempt to remove it because uh, they do 
have higher complication rates. So this is just technique of filter placement. We'll address questions at the end if you don't mind. Um, technique of filter placement, they can be placed through common femoral or internal jugular veins, uh, ultrasound guidance. You do an IVC vena cavagram, you want to identify the renal veins, put it below the um, lowest renal vein. Other key to filter placements, the caval diameter has to be less than 30 millimeters for most of the standard filters that are available. Question, um, so we'll move on to the next area. What is the most common complication following surgery or endovenous procedures performed to eliminate varicose veins? A, deep vein thrombosis, B, superficial thrombophlebitis, C, saphenous nerve injury, D, sural nerve injury, E, recurrent varicose veins. And the answer is E, recurrent varicose veins. So we're going to change gears, talk a little bit about varicose veins for the next few minutes. Um, again, varicose veins are enlarged, bulging, subcutaneous veins. They're typically tributaries of the superficial venous system. Uh, they can occur related to sort of floppy, uh, weakened vein wall valves. Um, Incompetent valves can contribute to propagation of these veins by transmitting pressure down the leg into those superficial veins. And then some superficial varicose veins are associated with superficial venous reflux, both within those varicose veins as well as within the main superficial veins, the great saphenous or small saphenous veins. Um, the initial treatment of varicose veins and superficial venous insufficiency is compression stockings. Um, you want to try to elevate legs throughout the course of the day. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications uh, may be helpful as well. If patients fail conservative therapy with compression stockings, lifestyle modification, anti-inflammatories, uh, Interventional treatments may be appropriate for them. Uh, and these interventions include removing the large varicosities that are associated with the inflammation and symptoms. And in patients who have significant uh, superficial venous insufficiency in the great saphenous or small saphenous vein that's associated with the varicosities, you can uh, eliminate that venous reflux as well as that's a source of continued venous hypertension. Removing uh, those veins uh, can prevent recurrence of varicose veins uh, compared to just doing the phlebectomy of the varicose veins themselves. In order to diagnose superficial venous reflux, duplex is probably the most um, commonly performed test. Um, and the way that we diagnose uh, reflux, uh, the definition is greater than 500 millisecond backwards flow. So how do we treat these? Um, vein stripping is still an established way of treating them, although I think most of us very uncommonly do this procedure. Uh, I don't think I've performed this procedure in 10 years. Uh, the most typical treatments are ablation of the great saphenous or small saphenous vein in some way. Um, this can be done with laser, sclerotherapy, um, radiofrequency, uh, depending on the um, uh, technology that's used in any particular office. Uh, vein stripping is effective um, if that's the technology you have. Um, that also takes that superficial vein out of circulation. Both of these techniques uh, uh, achieve the same thing. And the whole purpose of doing this is to remove uh, that source of reflux and source of pressure from continuing to uh, affect the varicose veins. Uh, the most uh, uh, Common complications, as we talked about with both of these treatments, is recurrence of varicosities over time. In the acute setting, uh, patients can additionally get DVT or endovenous heat-induced thrombosis, which is thrombus extending from the greater saphenous vein into the deep vein at the junction or from the small saphenous vein into the popliteal vein. Um, this probably occurs at a frequency of somewhere between 1 and 2 percent, and it varies in severity, and the Basic treatment, if there's significant thrombus extending into the deep vein, is anticoagulation. 
Typically, low molecular weight heparin is used because the anticoagulation uh, doesn't typically need to be carried on for as long as a traditional DVT. Uh, we'll, if we diagnose this, uh, we'll recheck the vein within a week and then potentially two weeks after that. And depending on the resolution of that thrombosis, we'll stop the anticoagulation once it's resolved. Again, recurrent varicose veins are the most common complication. Um, uh, Great saphenous vein occlusion is uh, probably the most effective thing to try to prevent this. Um, if it does occur, you want to examine those patients with duplex to look for uh, a reason for their recurrent varicosities and recurrent varicose veins. Sometimes you can have a duplicate system uh, in terms of the great saphenous. Sometimes you can have recanalization. Um, so here, there are just some sort of um, causes of recurrent varicose veins that you might want to consider and look for. Talked about a duplicated uh, greater saphenous system, an accessory uh, great saphenous vein that might be contributing to varicosities. Um, Neo-revascularization can occur in groins after vein strippings where new collaterals develop and then uh, feed varicose veins. Um, uh, if the great saphenous is not excluded from the circulation, you can develop recurrent varicose veins from this. Um, and then other causes such as perforator veins that contribute to the venous hypertension may also contribute to um, recurrent varicose veins. Um, so in addition to the treatment of the um, cause of the venous hypertension that might be contributing to varicose veins, removing the branch varicosities is useful in uh, reducing symptoms. You can either remove these with a stab phlebectomy, as shown in the diagram on the left. Some people will use foam or other sclerotherapy to treat varicose veins as well. There are a variety of different agents available for this. Both of these are acceptable treatments. So uh, we're going to move on to carotid artery disease for the next few slides. Um, Start with a question. Two weeks ago, a 74-year-old woman had an episode of left arm weakness lasting approximately five minutes before resolving completely. A carotid duplex exam demonstrated a peak systolic ve velocity of 310 centimeters per second and an end diastolic velocity of 126 centimeters per second in the right internal carotid artery. In the left internal carotid artery, the peak systolic velocity was 130 centimeters per second and the end diastolic velocity was 86 centimeters per second. What is the most appropriate treatment? A, 325 milligrams of aspirin per day and repeat carotid duplex in six months. B, immediate anticoagulation with heparin followed by warfarin. C, right carotid endarterectomy after confirmatory imaging and cardiac evaluation. D, emergent right carotid endarterectomy followed by left carotid endarterectomy in two weeks. And the correct answer is C, right carotid endarterectomy after confirmatory imaging and cardiac evaluation. So we'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of carotid stenosis, uh, some of the duplex criteria for degrees of carotid stenosis, indications for treatment, complications, and then the role of carotid angioplasty and stenting, and a very brief discussion of thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so carotid bifurcation plaque causes symptoms by uh, emboli or embolization related to uh, platelet or thrombotic emboli from uh, complicated plaque. The risk of stroke correlates with degree of stenosis. Uh, we have been attempting for years to identify ways to image uh, the complexity of plaques and the um, nature of plaques to see if this can correlate with uh, plaques that are more uh, at higher risk for embolizing, and uh, this has been sort of a work in progress. We generally believe that more complex plaques uh, may tend to embolize more, but we haven't been able to define that objectively. So far, the only um, objective measure uh, that correlates with risk of stroke is the degree of stenosis, uh, which is a surrogate for the amount or burden of plaque present in the carotid artery. Stroke in carotids is rarely related to decreased perfusion because of the uh, significant collateral flow that exists in the brain. 
Uh, so carotid disease can present asymptomatically, which is a common presentation uh, in the current day with uh, patients getting a lot of screenings, both from vascular surgeons as well as uh, uh, through their own accords. Um, they may present with a carotid bruit. A bruit is vibration or uh, an audible representation of turbulent flow in the carotid bifurcation. It's not a very sensitive or specific um, uh, finding uh, sign on physical exam. Patients may also present with a TIA or a stroke a TIA is a sudden, completely reversible neurologic event that occurs related to typically embolization. Um, a visual reversible symptom uh, can uh, be amaurosis fugax, which is an, uh, 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 also an embolic uh, event from the carotid artery. Uh, motor TIA can include weakness in one limb, uh, weakness of the face, um, uh, or uh, uh, speech-related symptoms. Um, and there can also be some sensory symptoms related to carotid embolization. The definition of stroke has sort of been evolving in the current era. Traditionally, a stroke was uh, de defined by neurologic deficits that persisted more than 24 hours. Uh, with current imaging studies, uh, sometimes we'll see findings of permanent uh, damage to the brain without symptoms that last this long. So uh, this is sort of a, um, the, the definition of stroke is, um, uh, is, is changing as, uh, as our, our imaging gets better. It's weakness of one limb, hemiplegia, uh, uh, dysarthria, aphasia, um, and again, it can have sensory symptoms as well, uh, just more permanent. Um, carotid duplex is a very good test for identifying carotid stenosis in someone that either presents with uh, brewery or with some neurologic symptoms. Um, it images the uh, area of the carotid bifurcation well. Um, the diagnostic criteria for degree of stenosis are dependent on um, uh, Doppler interrogation, uh, the whole principle, uh, physics principle, is that uh, frequency shifts uh, uh, in the ultrasound can quantify the velocity of the blood flow through the vessel. And the idea of velocity is important because the higher the velocity through a particular vessel, this suggests a more severe uh, luminal stenosis. Um, it's analogous to the concept of putting your finger over half of a garden hose and watching the water flow faster and further through that area when you do that. Um, it's important to uh, correlate your velocity results with some sort of imaging uh, with angiogram or CT angiogram. Um, the uh, criteria for different degrees of stenosis vary from lab to lab, so it's important to uh, pick a set of criteria and then correlate them uh, with CT angiogram in your own lab. This is uh, an example um, uh, of criteria for different degrees of stenosis. I think this is a good rule of thumb uh, in terms of learning different velocities and what correlates with different ranges of stenosis. Uh, so uh, there are other imaging options other than duplex, and uh, they have some advantages. I think every practice varies a little bit in terms of to what degree they use only duplex ultrasound to diagnose a carotid stenosis versus CT angiogram. Um, CT angiogram uh, in the current era is often performed because, uh, especially in patients that present with symptoms, they may be getting CT scans for other reasons and uh, will often get a CT angiogram. It can help you diagnose not just carotid disease, but additional intracranial disease. This may not uh, direct your decision in a symptomatic patient about whether or not to operate, but might help you um, in terms of post-operative management. Uh, MR angio versus CT really depends on, again, institutional uh, sort of biases in terms of equipment and software that's available. In general, invasive angiography um, in the current era is limited to people in whom the other two tests aren't really diagnostic or in someone in whom you're considering an endovascular intervention. So, um, this is just a summary of some of the uh, 
randomized trials, we have good evidence that for symptomatic patients with carotid stenosis, more than 70 percent, uh, surgery is significantly superior to medical management, uh, and we recommend surgery for anyone that's a reasonable uh, surgical candidate in these patients. Um, the stroke risk for medically managed patients is in the order of 9 percent compared to 26 percent. Um, uh, excuse me, the other way around. Medically managed patients have a 26% stroke risk. The surgically managed patients have a 9% stroke risk over uh, two years, um, according to the original NASET study. Uh, again, another representation of that. Uh, surgically managed patients have a significantly reduced stroke risk. And so symptomatic patients with more than 70% stenosis uh, get operations. For asymptomatic patients, there's also a benefit to surgery, although not as significant. Um, uh, the medically managed patients had an 11 percent risk of stroke at five years compared to a 5 percent risk. Um, this may be statistically significant because of a large number of patients, but from a clinical perspective, it's sort of a 1 percent risk versus 2 percent risk. It may not be that clinically significant. So for patients that... Um, have a more than 60% carotid stenosis, we're pretty selective, and most vascular surgeons will wait until that stenosis is 80% before recommending any kind of procedure for asymptomatic patients. So here's some general guidelines for treatment. Asymptomatic patients, uh, if the stenosis, here they describe more than 70%, uh, most of us will probably wait for 80% um, to recommend intervention. For symptomatic patients, uh, there's evidence that uh, there's benefit for intervention for anything more than 60% stenosis with uh, symptoms. There are a number of different factors in terms of carotid endarterectomy and how it's done uh, that influence um, uh, uh, that have been studied to look at whether or not they have better or worse treatments. So um, carotid endarterectomy is done by controlling the internal and external and common carotid arteries, opening up the common onto the internal carotid artery, removing the plaque, and then closing it. Um, if there is uh, an interruption in blood flow and the collaterals are not adequate, the patient may have cerebral ischemia. Um, there has been controversy over whether all patients should be shunted or there should be monitoring done to look for whether certain patients should be shunted. Uh, the bottom line is that the studies have not shown any benefit to one technique versus another. So there are people that don't shunt anyone, there are people that shunt everyone, and there are people that shunt selectively using different monitoring techniques. Uh, including things like stump pressure, EEG monitoring, um, and there's been no difference in stroke rate shown with any of these particular techniques. So everyone pretty much does what they're experienced with and comfortable and can have similar um, uh, results. Um, I'm just going to skip over some of this stuff. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's really not no, no difference seen with selective versus routine shunting. They've looked at what kind of anesthetic is used. Some people will be able to perform the surgery with local anesthetic, with um, uh, uh, some component of a regional block. Again, uh, the outcomes have not been shown to be any different for general versus uh, local anesthesia. Uh, we'll start with a. We'll go with another question. A 62-year-old man had an uncomplicated left carotid endarterectomy two hours ago. In the recovery room, he becomes progressively tachypneic and agitated. Physical exam reveals left neck fullness. What is the appropriate treatment? A, reverse, reversal of heparin with protamine. B, perform bedside cricothyroidotomy. C, reopen cervical incision in the recovery room. D, emergent return to the operating room for cervical hematoma. Evacuation, E, administer oxygen and racemic epi to alleviate laryngospasm. And the correct answer is D, emergent return to the operating room for cervical hematoma evacuation. Um, so um, just to talk briefly a little bit about um, uh, carotid endarterectomy, um, you know, there are some large studies showing that carotid endarterectomy um, is beneficial. 
some of the limitations of uh, these studies included that um, they were all performed in pretty high volume centers, performed by surgeons that did a lot of carotids, and so um, the complication rates may not have been as accurate. And um, this uh, was sort of a lead into a lot of people being enthusiastic about less invasive ways to treat the carotid arteries, such as carotid angioplasty and stenting. This became very popular, um, probably close to 2005, 2008, um, in terms of trying to treat carotid lesions. So the argument was that uh, although carotid endarterectomy has been shown to be very safe um, in large studies, that the people in these studies weren't the everyday uh, surgeons that were performing these at all centers, and that maybe we could offer some better results with angioplasty and stenting. Um, the way things have panned out, uh, you know, here are some of the appeal of endovascular treatment are listed. Um, the way things have panned out, the risk of uh, angioplasty and stenting of the carotid artery, particularly the risk of stroke, is significantly higher. Uh, it's come out in a number of different studies. And so the role of carotid stenting currently is um, relatively limited. Um, it is... Uh, an appropriate uh, treatment for patients with a severe stenosis uh, with symptoms who are either at high medical risk or high anatomic risk. The issue of the high medical risk becomes a little fuzzy because while we define patients um, with recent MIs, congestive heart failure, angina, pulmonary disease as being high medical risk, carotid surgery is actually very well tolerated under appropriate an anesthetic uh, conditions with expert anesthesiologists. Uh, it's not particularly stressful to the heart other than the anesthesia. And so uh, the medical risk may, um, may not be an absolute indication for stenting. The anatomic risk is probably the most common reason that we perform carotid stenting currently. Um, there's a significantly higher risk of carotid stenting with age, uh, particularly in patients over 80 in whom we essentially don't perform this uh, typically anymore. Um, Cerebral protection is used with carotid stenting, uh, but it's imperfect and you can still get uh, emboli. Um, and the characterization of which plaques may be safe to stent are also very difficult um, based on the current imaging techniques. We're not very good at predicting which plaques um, are safe versus vulnerable. Um, and then our medical therapy these days is better, so this brings into question whether we ought to stent patients that have not had symptoms um, and have a carotid stenosis that are high medical risk for uh, surgery if we would consider surgery otherwise. So um, all of these things have led to a much narrower reason for stenting um, patients and uh, in general, carotid endarterectomy is the procedure that we consider of choice in patients in whom we think a procedure is indicated. Um, surgery, as I said, is the standard of care. Um, the stents, in my mind, are reserved for high-risk patients, particularly uh, anatomic high-risk patients uh, who have severe, uh, who've had symptoms, excuse me. Uh, and then pretty much everyone else, asymptomatic patients that might be higher medical risk or asymptomatic patients that have moderate stenosis, uh, medical management is probably the most appropriate treatment of those patients. Um, so again, this sort of goes through some uh, criteria of patients that are most appropriate for these different types of uh, uh, treatments. Um, it really just reiterates what we talked about on the last um, last slide. Uh, and then I just want to talk a few minutes about some of the complications that can occur after carotid surgery. These are often questions that might get asked of you. Um, some of the scenarios that um, are asked about are things uh, like a patient that wakes up with a neurologic deficit after a carotid endarterectomy. Um, the um, uh, diagnosis uh, uh, to exclude uh, is, of course, thrombosis or a technical error at the site. This patient should be re-explored. Um, you can consider 
imaging them, but for the purposes of doing the safest thing, re-exploring that carotid is probably the right answer. Um, neck fullness in the recovery room or uh, on the floor after a surgery with respiratory difficulty is another uh, condition. This is a cervical hematoma. This can compress the airway. Um, these patients should be intubated and then they should be, have their hematomas evacuated in the OR. Um, you should try to avoid exploring these necks on the uh, floor. This can be catastrophic and a disaster. Uh, getting an into, uh, breathing uh, and a tube into the airway as soon as possible is probably the most appropriate and important thing in them to control their airway. Uh, and then various neurologic uh, injuries that can occur after carotid uh, tongue deviation, um, uh, typically to the side of the injury, is related to hypoglossal nerve injury. Uh, this is typically treated by observation, usually from praxia uh, f or from stretching at the time of surgery. Swallowing difficulty, particularly discoordination and aspiration, can be a glossopharyngeal nerve injury. The glossopharyngeal nerve fibers cross the carotid very high on the carotid behind the styloid process, and so if you have a high carotid exposure, this can occur. Uh, this can be a difficult problem to manage. Uh, recovery can take... Um, uh, quite a while. Sometimes patients will end up with a feeding tube uh, because they're not able to swallow. Hoarseness uh, is a vagus nerve injury. The vagus nerve travels in the carotid sheath uh, with um, the carotid artery and the jugular vein. You want to look out for it. And the way that this nerve gets injured is from the clamp being placed because you haven't done a dissection right on the common carotid artery. So a clamp injury is the most common way that the vagus nerve can get injured. And then finally, a headache that occurs uh, in the post-op period uh, several days after the operation to up to 10 days can be the result of cerebral hyperperfusion. This can be a combination of swelling or bleeding into the brain. Uh, typically occurs with high-grade stenoses that have been then reopened. Uh, hypertension is a risk factor, which is one of the reasons we pay a lot of attention to controlling blood pressure after carotid surgery. Um, and this can be catastrophic depending on the degree. Um, uh, anyone that presents with a headache um, that calls my office gets a CT scan. If, they, if the headache's bad enough that they're making a phone call, then they get a CT scan to look for edema, and these patients get admitted. Uh, briefly, discuss subclavian steel syndrome. This is uh, caused by a subclavian artery stenosis proximal to the vertebral artery. The pathophysiology is that it results in reversal of vertebral artery flow um, uh, down the vertebral artery to supply the arm. Uh, and the symptoms can be most commonly asymptomatic, but if they are going to occur, there are signs of posterior fossa ischemia, and they occur typically with use of the arm, which results in stealing blood flow. Uh, subclavian stenosis, if it's asymptomatic, typically we do not uh, recommend any intervention for it. It can be treated endovascularly or with a carotid subclavian bypass or uh, subclavian artery transposition. Uh, vertebral artery stenosis uh, is often uh, seen and, again, does not have symptoms. Indications for, symptom, indications for treatment include vertebrobasilar ischemia or extensive uh, four-vessel disease with extracranial disease um, in a situation where this is the most treatable lesion. Endovascular treatment options are being used more for these, um, especially for origin stenoses. Um, parts of the vertebral artery are difficult to um, expose. Um, you can transpose the vertebral, for a proximal stenosis, you can transpose the vertebral artery onto the common carotid artery in the neck, or you can do a bypass from the common carotid artery to the vertebral artery. More distal lesions are more difficult, uh, uh, more difficult to treat um, in this setting. <clears throat> Uh, we'll have another question. Uh, in neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, brachial plexus compression most frequently occurs at what anatomic site? A, scalene triangle. B, costoclavicular space. C, pectoralis minor space. D, inferior to the cervical rib. Or E, infraclavicular space. And the correct answer is A, scalene triangle. So uh, thoracic outlet syndrome 
uh, typically a disease of younger people, uh, more common in uh, women. There are some anatomic variants, such as uh, a persistent cervical rib remnant uh, that can be associated with thoracic outlet syndrome. There are essentially three types of thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, neurogenic, uh, which is related to compression of the brachial plexus, venous, related to compression and trauma to the uh, subclavian vein, and arterial, which is most commonly associated with uh, cervical rib uh, injuring a uh, subclavian artery. Um, there are different predisposing factors um, and symptoms that the patient can present with, and these are really sort of uh, different spectrum of diseases uh, related to one uh, anatomic area. Um, some of the ways that we diagnose this uh, for especially neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, which is the most common uh, type of thoracic outlet syndrome, are physical provocative maneuvers to uh, compress uh, the brachial plexus. Uh, within the spaces that it travels through before it enters the arm. Um, for venous thoracic outlet syndrome, the most common presentation is an upper extremity DVT, and so it's important to consider this in a younger active person that presents with upper extremity DVT. Uh, we're more aggressive and lice these patients open to diagnose this particular syndrome to try to improve their functional um, capacity over the long run. And then uh, arterial thoracic outlet outlet syndrome often presents with arm ischemia to a varying degree. Sometimes uh, progressive embolization episodes can occur because that artery has become traumatized and irregular, um, and sometimes you can have an acute sort of thrombotic episode uh, that needs to be treated. Um, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome uh, mostly is treated with physical therapy and non-operative treatments. Um, when surgical therapy is contemplated, which I think is sort of an evolving target and probably is being done less for just purely neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, scalene resection is an important uh, component of this. Um, uh, but it's important to try to define where that uh, brachial plexus is really being compressed. Um, often muscular abnormalities um, and congenital abnormalities can be associated with this and have to be addressed, so you have to really free up the whole brachial plexus if you're going to approach this. Venous uh, thoracic outlet syndrome uh, is treated after initial thrombolysis by first rib resection and freeing up the vein. Um, often a post-op angioplasty of the vein may be necessary. And then arterial uh, thoracic outlet syndrome may require embolectomy, thrombectomy, resection of the traumatized artery, um, and of course addressing the cervical rib if that is the issue. This is an anatomic diagram of the spaces where uh, different structures may be compressed. Uh, in the thoracic outlet, there's a scaling triangle. This is the most common place for Neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, the costoclavicular space is the primary place where venous compression tends to occur and where we need to address venous thoracic outlet syndrome. And then the pectoralis minus, minor space is another area where the brachial plexus can also be uh, compressed and important to consider that. Again, just more anatomic uh, structure showing the um, location of the vein and the subclavian artery as well as the scalene muscle. Uh, and the brachial plexus. So uh, we talked a little bit about the three spaces of compression. Scalene triangle, most common site of brachial plexus compression. That's where the cervical ribs are and where they um, can affect the artery. Uh, costoclavicular space, the space between the first rib and the clavicle, um, is where a subclavian vein can get compressed, both by bony structures as well as the subclavius muscle itself. And then the pectoralis minor space is another space to consider for uh, uh, neurogenic uh, brachial plexus compression. These are some of the provocative tests that we do to try to define and um, uh, reproduce the symptoms uh, that the patient is experiencing, particularly important for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, and defining, you know, getting additional imaging studies is sort of plus minus for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. I think it's more of a clinical diagnosis. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I think most of us will, uh, for that type of thoracic outlet syndrome, try to uh, use physical therapy before um, uh, uh, considering any kind of operative intervention. So we're just going to change gears to some vascular trauma, which I think is important for 
purposes of your boards. We'll talk about injuries of the neck, thoracic aortic injuries, extremity injuries, and abdominal injuries. Um, 19-year-old man was stabbed in the mid-right neck. On exam, he has a pulsatile right neck mass that appears to be expanding. What is the most appropriate next step in treatment of his zone 2 penetrating neck injury? A, aortic arch an angiogram and possible covered stent. B, CT angiogram of the chest and neck. D, emergent right neck exploration and ligation of the right common carotid uh, artery. E, emergent right neck exploration and primary repair of the right common carotid artery injury. E, emergent sternotomy for proximal arterial control of brachiocephalic artery. The correct answer is D, emergent right neck exploration and primary repair of the right common carotid artery injury. Uh, so the um, issue of penetrating neck trauma, um, the location of injury to the uh, neck is defined by the zones uh, of the neck. Uh, zone one is uh, sternal notch to one centimeter above the clavicular head. Zone two is one centimeter above the clavicular head to the angle of the mandible. And zone three is above the angle of the mandible to the base of the skull. Uh, the idea of these zones is important in terms of management for the stable patient. Uh, the traditional recommendations have been that all zone two injury should be explored if they penetrate the platysma. Uh, for zone one injuries, angiogram uh, and other diagnostic evaluation is appropriate to look for uh, more proximal injuries and plan treatment. And for zone three, um, CT scan, angiogram, and laryngoscopy, again, appropriate because of the difficulty of being able to explore, explore vascular structures in this location. Um, one of the problems with using those zones is that uh, often the definition of those zones can become fuzzy depending on the patient's particular anatomy, if they have a short neck, if the injury is at a borderline. Often the wound site on the skin isn't the same as the wound site to the actual vessel. Um, and a lot of mandatory explorations aren't therapeutic. Um, so in general, if the platysma is not violated, we don't tend to explore them. And we look for hard signs of vascular injury. Um, and obviously, if there are any hard signs present, we tend to explore those lesions, but not uh, uh, otherwise. Um, and then if the patient is stable, you can think about doing other uh, diagnostic evaluation as well. So obviously this is an example of some hard signs of injury, any kind of active bleeding, expanding hematoma, neurologic deficit, brewy over the wound itself. Those people should all be explored in one way or another. Some of the softer signs uh, may warrant getting um, uh, additional imaging rather than direct exploration, history of bleeding, stable hematoma, um, uh, possible blast injury rather than um, direct uh, injury in that location. So there's a couple of slides coming through here that I'm going to um, probably flash through quickly that just go through some algorithms, and I think it's helpful just to take a look at those uh, before your exam uh, in terms of how you want to approach some of these patients. This is for zone one management. Um, basically, um, if patients are stable, uh, you can evaluate for occult injuries first using chest x-ray, often CT angiogram, and then address uh, associated injuries as well as um, looking for arterial injuries. The CT scan often can get you a lot of this information in one study uh, in terms of looking for occult injuries, looking for arterial injuries, um, as well as evaluating the uh, GI tract. Zone two uh, management, um, if patients are um, unstable or have obvious injury heart signs, they go to the operating room. Uh, otherwise, you can look at the wound uh, locally if it uh, penetrates the platysma. Uh, you can either explore them or think about selective management depending on the patient. If it does not penetrate the platysma, you don't necessarily need to explore them. And then finally, zone three management can be the most difficult. Uh, uh, if they are um, stable, uh, you can again get additional imaging to evaluate for occult injury uh, and then think about uh, management of that injury. If they're unstable, um, then they need to be explored. Um, 
common uh, popular question about how you approach different types of injuries. Uh, zone one is often um, asked about, and depending on what vessel you think is injured based on your imaging, your exploration may differ. For um, right subclavian artery and common carotid artery proximal injuries, you need to do a sternotomy. However, the left subclavian artery proximally can't be exposed well from a sternotomy, and they need a high uh, left anterolateral thoracotomy to expose the left subclavian artery. A lot of these injuries in this day and age will be managed endovascularly, but uh, good to know the exposures. Zone two injuries, incision along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, like a carotid. And then zone three injuries often will require division of the digastric, maybe subluxation of the mandible or an osteotomy to get higher exposure if you need it. Uh, some technical details of neck exploration sort of described here. I won't spend a lot of time going into this. We have a bunch of other stuff we still need to discuss. Um, here's a, just some images of the anatomy and the nerve structures that uh, you need to look out for. Hypoglossal nerve, vagus nerve are the uh, two keys. Um, uh, that you want to avoid injuring in the process of the dissection. Um, so penetrating carotid injury, who gets repaired, who doesn't, how we address it. Um, in general, um, uh, for a simple injury without any flow interruption, uh, we tend to repair carotid injuries no matter what, whether they've caused symptoms or how major they are. I think there's... Um, uh, those patients do very well with a simple repair. Um, if there's flow interruption, if the carotid is thrombosed, if there's um, sort of brisk back bleeding, you should repair it. If um, there's minimal back bleeding or there's uh, significant risk that uh, vessels uh, thrombose distally, you might want to consider ligating it. Um, the neurostatus may help inform whether or not patients should be uh, repaired. Uh, if the patient has intact neurologic status, we try to maintain their cerebrovascular perfusion to as close to normal as possible. Depending on the severity of the deficit and the timing of the deficit, if they've had a severe deficit that's been prolonged, uh, ligation may be more appropriate with a penetrating injury in that setting. Um, if the patient is unstable, again, we tend to think about ligating to get something uh, fixed quickly and out of there. Um, and then a number of inaccessible lesions, either proximal or more distal. Now we can consider endovascular treatments with stents, um, with very distal carotid injuries that were penetrating and bleeding uh, and difficult to access. Ligation was usually the answer of choice prior to endovascular options. Uh, blunt carotid injury, um, again, a neuro deficit with a normal CT scan, you should suspect it with the right mechanisms. Uh, might have a brewy, some bleeding from ears, nose, mouth, expanding hematoma in the neck, Horner syndrome uh, associated with basilar skull fractures. Um, and uh, again, um, Depending on the clinical scenario, the treatment options vary. If it's an inaccessible lesion, minor injury, you might want to just watch it. Uh, with an accessible pseudoaneurysm or injury that's visible, you should repair it. Um, dissections generally are managed non-operatively. Um, <clears throat> and then a balloon occlusion may be the appropriate treatment for a carotid cavernous fistula. Uh, vertebral artery injuries, uh, again, um, unstable patients, um, think about ligating in a stable patient. Uh, you can think about endovascular treatments. Um, if it's minor, you can consider uh, observing those injuries as well. The stroke risk in general is very low with vertebral artery injuries. Here's just an anatomy of exposing the vertebral artery. Uh, so uh, just to change modes a little bit, a 22-year-old man was stabbed in the left Mid-thigh, he is hemodynamically normal. There is a deep five centimeter stab wound on the medial aspect of the left mid-thigh with no external bleeding. There is a moderate sized non-pulsatile hematoma near the injury. Left ankle systolic pressure is 130 millimeters mercury and right arm systolic pressure is 125 millimeters mercury. What is the most appropriate management strategy? A, left lower extremity contrast angiography. B, discharge home after 24 hours of observation. C, surgical exploration of left thigh wound. D, ultrasound duplex of left lower extremity. E, CT angiogram of aorta and bilateral lower extremity runoff.
And the correct answer is B, uh, observation is the appropriate management for somebody with normal ABIs in an asymptomatic patient. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, extremity vascular trauma. It can occur in a variety of different places. Um, some images. Uh, so we separate out uh, presenting signs and symptoms um, between hard signs, soft signs, and asymptomatic patients. Um, hard signs of vascular trauma include active hemorrhage, expanding hematoma, uh, brewery or thrill over the area of injury, absent distal pulses, uh, symptoms of distal ischemia. And uh, these are basically indications for immediate OR exploration and repair. Um, we usually reserve preoperative imaging for patients that present with multi-level trauma and may have other uh, things to evaluate, as well as if the uh, site of injury isn't clear based on the uh, history and levels of trauma. A number of patients present with soft signs, such as proximity to blood vessels, uh, peripheral nerve deficit, bleeding at the scene, but no further bleeding uh, when evaluated in the hospital, non-expanding hematomas, and possibly reduced pulses. Um, the ABI exam, bedside exam using the pressure cuff, as we talked about, is a really useful adjunct in these uh, settings and is a good indicator of severity of injury. Um, it really has replaced screening angiogram for soft signs in trauma patients. Uh, an ABI of um, less than uh, 0.9 um, has a, is a significant predictor of injury uh, subsequently. Um, some of the exceptions in terms of the accuracy of the ABI include injuries to vessels such as the profunda that may not directly affect the ABI, so non-axial blood vessels. Um, artery injury that might be uh, uh, um, in, in, sort of in continuity injury, an injury that doesn't completely transect or thrombose a vessel, such as a fistula or an intimal flap within a vessel that might cause intermittent ischemia or predisposed to thrombosis. And it's more difficult to interpret in an elderly patient who may have peripheral arterial disease. So uh, you want to look for asymmetry when it comes to ABIs. If somebody has abnormal ABIs in the affected and unaffected uh, extremity, it may not be as accurate a test, uh, in which case you may need additional imaging. Um, some specific traumatic scenarios with the periphery knee dislocation is a scenario that's high risk for injury, particularly a posterior knee dislocation. Uh, popliteal arteries fixed proximally and distally behind the joint, and injury at the knee level, especially posterior knee dislocations, can cause intimal tears that then lead to thrombosis of the popliteal artery. There's a 50% risk of arterial injury with posterior knee dislocations. Um, again, the ABI is a good adjunct to uh, uh, physical exam uh, in a patient that doesn't have additional symptoms in a patient that does have symptoms, their arteries likely injured. Um, we um, have a low threshold for other imaging studies just to help us plan our repair if the patient's getting imaging anyway. Um, in general, in terms of extremity trauma, uh, there's often associated uh, musculoskeletal injuries, so these should be uh, stabilized. Uh, as with the posterior knee dislocation, the knee should be relocated. Um, and then there's some role, depending on how extensive orthopedic work needs to be done for temporary shunting. You want to typically get the orthopedic stuff fixed first uh, in order not to risk your arterial reconstruction. Um, and then uh, some of the things asked about which what kind of conduit should you use? You want to use vein because it's a dirty site. You want to use it from the other extremity because you don't want to um, uh, resect vein. Uh, often there are venous injuries associated with arterial injuries in that extremity, so you want to not take the greater saphenous vein from the same extremity. Um, you want to try to repair any venous injuries that you find, if at all possible, and you want to avoid ligating. That's a um, second option, not the first option. So again, this is just a flow chart going through some of the stuff we already talked about with the ABI as an adjunct and then that directing whether the patient gets additional imaging um, uh, uh, or if they have hard signs to begin with, then we um, don't bother with any further testing. They end up going to the operating room. So a little bit about blunt thoracic aortic injury. Um, 
Uh, the mechanism is generally a high velocity impact in a restrained passenger because the aorta is fixed at the pulmonary uh, ligament, and this is where it tends to occur. Some of the x ray clues are described here. Uh, CT scan these days, CT angiogram, will make the diagnosis. Um, surgical repair uh, traditionally used to be open, but nowadays is probably much more commonly done endovascularly. Uh, you want to get with the open repair, uh, the typical description is that you want to get control between the left common carotid and the left subclavian because the injury occurs uh, at the left subclavian origin. Um, uh, distal control uh, is in the descending thoracic aorta, and then repairing it primarily versus uh, graft. Um, Often it's hard to size grafts in this setting because the patient is underperfused and hypotensive and their aorta may appear smaller than it actually is. Um, uh, the high rates of morbidity and mortality are really associated with um, other associated injuries that also tend to occur in this setting. Um, endovascular repair is a good option for many of these patients. Um, lower risk of paralysis, less invasive. Um, doesn't require a bypass. Uh, results have shown that it works as well as open surgical repair uh, and, in fact, has less stent-related mortality. Unfortunately, a lot of these patients have associated injuries, and that uh, affects their morbidity and mortality. Um, some of the issues are related to vascular access. We talked about that with the iliac arteries. If they're smaller, especially in younger, healthier patients, um, you can get uh, injuries to the iliac vessels on the way up. Um, and uh, these devices are bigger, so those injuries can be potentially um, more problematic. Um, stroke is a complication uh, depending uh, on one, embolization risk, uh, which is, should be relatively controlled because these patients are not patients with a lot of atherosclerotic disease in their arches, but two, related to coverage of the left subclavian if that becomes necessary. Um, uh, um, it's pretty well tolerated, but there is some uh, stroke risk. Um, renal failure related to contrast. Um, sizing of the graft can be difficult in some of these patients because, as I mentioned, their aortas may appear smaller than they actually are if they're depending on their volume status. And then finally, uh, spinal cord ischemia is an important uh, consideration. This is um, Less of a risk uh, in the sense that we don't typically have to cover as much of the thoracic aorta in traumatic patients, but um, when you cover the left subclavian artery, if you end up having to cover that, um, the collateral flow uh, from that area is um, a potential, uh, puts you at a potentially higher risk of spinal cord ischemia, so it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um, there's a Several slides discussing the segmental supply of the spinal cord and some of the pathophysiology of spinal cord ischemia. The take home message is that spinal cord ischemia in these patients is a complicated process. Um, it can be <coughs> caused by factors including the collateral flow and thrombosis of intercostal vessels, uh, as well as hemodynamic factors affecting the uh, spinal cord and perfusion and reperfusion injury. Some of the strategies for trying to prevent are to try to um, optimize collateral flow, both from the subclavian artery as well as distal perfusion, um, to try to drain CSF to reduce the amount of edema and um, pressure in the spinal canal, cool the tissues to try to prevent tissue injury, uh, as well as with open cases to re-implant uh, collateral flow. Um, so a uh, little bit more about trauma. Um, what vascular structures are most likely to be injured in a patient who sustained a gunshot wound to the abdomen and is found to have a zone one hematoma? A, aorta and inferior vena cava. B, renal artery and vein. C, iliac artery and vein. D, portal vein. E, hepatic artery. The correct answer is A, aorta and inferior vena cava. So um, uh, vascular injuries to the abdomen, most of them occur from penetrating injuries, less common from uh, non-penetrating. Um, usually with penetrating injuries, there are multiple injuries to intra-abdominal organs, not just the vascular structures. Uh, presentation can range from uh, mild hypotension and a contained hematoma to uh, distended abdomen with active hemorrhage. Um, uh, 
the retroperitoneal hematoma zones are important to keep in mind in terms of what may be injured and how it's managed. Zone one injuries are midline, uh, either above or below the mesocolon. Zone two injuries are lateral, and zone three injuries in the retroperitoneum are pelvic. And then there are port porta and retrohepatic uh, uh, injuries, which are usually associated with liver injuries as well. So in zone one, the contents are the aorta and the inferior vena cava. Zone two, the contents are the renal arteries and veins typically. And in zone three, the iliac arteries and veins as well as other pelvic uh, vessels. Um, the management strategy in blunt injury in general is um, not to explore. Um, uh, with the exception of uh, expanding or pulsatile hematoma, um, a zone three injury with an absent femoral pulse that might indicate an iliac arterial injury, uh, paraduodenal hematoma, as well as uh, a me large mesenteric hematoma with bowel ischemia that might indicate a visceral vessel injury. With penetrating injuries, the general rule of thumb is that we explore all the zones. Um, uh, again, the exception there is a retrohepatic hematoma. These can be a huge danger zone to explore, and uh, it's really a difficult area. You should really try to avoid exploring that area unless absolutely necessary. Here I, uh, we just uh, enumerate some of the control maneuvers. You guys can look at, um, look at some of these maneuvers. I'm sure um, uh, you may have encountered some of them in residency or in trauma cases. Um, uh, the um, key to the retrohepatic uh, injuries is try to avoid uh, exploring those areas. And then how do we repair things? The aorta, typically a suture or a patch or a graft, depending on how injured it is. The key is to try to cover it and separate it from uh, the intra-abdominal content, just like if you would do it for an aneurysm repair. The IVC, um, you can try to clamp it partially, if possible, uh, to try to maintain IVC flow. Clamping the IVC totally can be difficult to tolerate, especially in a trauma patient. Some of the tough areas of the vein are areas of vein confluence where the renal veins come in uh, or where the iliac veins uh, join the IVC. These areas can be very weakened. Vein injuries are actually more difficult to repair than arterial injuries. Um, you want to try to roll the vein to try to expose the posterior wall to look for injuries both front and back. You want to make sure you don't miss an injury to the back of the vein that's through and through. And in a damage control situation, you can ligate if you have to. Um, you might need to do fasciotomies if you have to ligate the cava. Um, and then renal artery injuries, uh, if it's a simple injury, you can repair it versus a complex injury, which typically requires nephrectomy. Um, the right-sided uh, venous injuries are often very difficult to manage because they're tough to expose um, and uh, are often associated with nephrectomy. Uh, again, some tips about repairing iliac arteries. Um, Again, you want to repair these if possible. There's a very high amputation rate if you end up ligating these arteries, uh, trying to repair the veins if at all possible. Um, one special circumstance is the retroperitoneal hematoma after an arterial puncture, after a cath, um, tends to occur in the iliopsoas. Uh, compression neuropathy can often accompany this. Um, some of the clues are hypotension, lower abdominal pain, thigh pain and numbness, quadricep weakness. Um, a puncture above the inguinal ligament uh, is often seen with this type of hematoma. Um, and the management in general, if they have a neurologic deficit, they need to be decompressed. If there's ongoing blood loss, they need to be explored to repair the artery. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, stop anticoagulation, try to follow. Um, and I'm just going to spend like three minutes going over hemodialysis access. I know that we've gone over a little bit, but I just want to describe some basics so you have uh, general ideas for the boards. The slides tend to cover everything. Um, so we're going to talk about just some options, evaluation, and then some of the complications. Um, I'm going to skip the question for now so that we can move on to some of the stuff. So um, general options for dialysis, catheters, non-tunneled, tunneled, and then a fistula or a graft. Um, and there are clinical factors that inform what you should do. It's pretty much common sense for somebody with need for urgent dialysis that might be temporary, a non-tunneled catheter is appropriate. Otherwise, uh, for uh, urgent dialysis that may be chronic, a tunneled catheter is appropriate, especially if you're trying to establish AV access. 
AV fistulas are useful uh, in terms of long-term durability, but they require more time to mature. And AV grafts uh, are useful if the superficial veins aren't of adequate caliber. Um, uh, and sometimes in elderly patients in whom you, the fistulas may have a more difficult time maturing, we think. So general guidelines in terms of uh, order of choice uh, and what type of access to perform, this is sometimes asked in terms of first versus last choices. Uh, the more distal the, a fistula you can create to start with, the better. This helps in terms of preserving access sites. Also, also superficial veins may be more superficial in the forearm compared to the upper arm. Uh, an upper arm fistula is a second choice. Uh, in terms of a third choice, um, a uh, upper arm basilic vein transposition, which is a fistula that requires additional uh, procedure to superficialize the vein in the upper arm uh, versus an AV graft. It's a little controversial which one you might start with. Um, so either a forearm graft versus a basilic vein in the upper arm. And then uh, the upper arm AV graft is a fourth choice. And then finally, the lower extremity is uh, the last choice. And the reason for this is a higher infection risk um, and more likelihood of disease in these vessels. So again, just some diagrams of the types of grafts which you can look at at your leisure. Uh, just general principle planning considerations for access. You want to try to avoid catheters associated with infection risk, associated with DVTs, and with injury uh, to the veins over time that can lead to uh, stenosis. Fistula first is a general principle uh, that we ascribe to. We try to vein map all patients, and uh, in general, uh, we try to get our nephrologist to send patients at least six months before they uh, need dialysis so that we can at least consider fistula placement. If it turns out they're not a good candidate for a fistula and they need a graft, we can wait a little bit longer before we put a graft in. Uh, typically, you need a vein caliber greater than three millimeters to make a fistula, um, and then they tend to require six to eight weeks, sometimes a little bit longer to mature. Principles, as we talked about, start as distally as possible. Uh, veins are usually better than prosthetic. Um, you want to do a direct uh, fistula as much as possible, followed by uh, transposing, and then taking a vein from another location and moving it is a final option. Uh, we use the non-dominant extremity first if we can, and the upper extremity before the lower extremity. Um, I'm going to skip this. There's an, this is just sort of a more complex principles that we uh, think about. Um, venous translocations using the saphenous or brachial veins, um, chest wall accesses are sometimes an option, um, uh, a loop graft from the axillary vein to the axillary artery versus a necklace configuration from one side to the other. This can sometimes be useful in really morbidly obese patients where most of that obesity doesn't tend to occur on the chest wall as much as it does in the extremities or in other parts of the body. Um, lower extremity grafts might be useful once the upper extremities have been uh, used up or if they have central venous stenosis in the upper extremities. And then there are newer sort of graft catheter combinations where we can recanalize occluded veins and attach them to arteries to make uh, sort of hybrid uh, AV access uh, grafts. Um, some of the surgical techniques I'm going to skip over and then just briefly about Complications, so things that can occur, venous stenosis, uh, endovascular options are typically the main uh, way to treat those. Um, thrombosis of the graft, uh, thrombectomy or lysis, and then looking for a cause for the thrombosis, either inflow or outflow stenosis. Um, Thrombosis of a fistula, particularly if it occurs early, is sort of um, associated with a very poor patency. So uh, we are selective about who gets thrombectomized when it comes to fistulas. We try uh, to get our dialysis centers to call us early in terms of higher pressures or any issues with dialysis so we can evaluate those particular patients. There's not really a good standard for using uh, routine surveillance duplex. Um, the complication of infection, especially with grafts, is uh, difficult to manage. Uh, one, if the graft becomes infected within 30 days of placement, you tend to have to remove the entire graft. If you get a localized infection more chronically later on, you may be able to remove and reroute the graft. Uh, it, this isn't 
doesn't work if it involves the anastomosis, but if the infection does not involve the anastomosis, that can be a useful technique to preserve the access so that it can continue to be used. If there's a perianastomotic infection, you've got to remove the entire graft. And then with fistulas, sometimes we'll try to um, treat with antibiotics and we'll try to avoid removing those. Infection of an autologous uh, fistula uh, will typically only be really aggressive about removing it early on if we think it's causing septic emboli. And then the final issue uh, of steel syndrome, uh, this is uh, decreased arterial flow, um, uh, typically from uh, a um, uh, fistula that's taking too much blood flow uh, compared to the distal flow. Um, and the treatment options include ligation of the fistula, which loses the access, not a great option, banding of the fistula to try to narrow it, which usually doesn't work very well because if you band it enough, it'll often thrombose that fistula. And then there are a variety of um, revascularization procedures that might improve the flow to the distal um, forearm and hand. Um, the most commonly cited is the drill procedure. This involves a distal revascularization. So you take the inflow from well above the fistula, usually seven to 10 centimeters, and you uh, sew the bypass graft into the artery below the fistula. Uh, and then you ligate the artery uh, above the distal anastomosis of the bypass graft, but below the fistula, so that the blood flow to the artery comes off first before the blood flow to the fistula. This is um, uh, probably the procedure of choice uh, in a patient with um, uh, steel syndrome. Um, so again, this just goes over some of the techniques. Um, and then there's a version of steel syndrome that affects only the nerves and of the hand and the forearm. It causes severe discomfort in the forearm and the hand. Often these patients will have palpable uh, pulses. There typically occurs in patients with elderly that are elderly that have diabetes, um, more with more proximal fistulas, uh, brachial artery origin. Um, and the reason for this is pre-existing small vessel disease, low uh, ischemic threshold for the nerves, uh, tends to occur right after fistula creation. Um, and you typically need to ligate the fistula to treat this. It's really, um, it's really difficult um, to treat it once you've placed a fistula. Uh, and then I'm gonna skip over all this stuff. Um, there's really no good sort of surveillance recommendations for fistulas. Generally, if there are issues with the use of the fistula or the graft, uh, we tend to recommend looking at the graft with either duplex or venogram. If there aren't issues, then um, there's not good evidence that surveillance helps. Thanks for bearing with. Sorry to go over a little bit. That was a lot of stuff. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I know you guys may have other lectures coming up.